conversations that matter. I am your host, Marie Younger Blackburn, your host and your moderator. Um, conversations that matter is a candid conversation with a um, group of group of panelists um, in the areas of race, inclusion, diversity, and social justice. Uh, today we have with us um, a group of panelists and we will um, discuss among other things, uh, the question is, is there really um, justice for all? So welcome everybody, we're glad to have you here. Um, a little housekeeping, please put your um, comments and your questions in the chat. We'd love to hear from you so that we can have um, things to talk about with our panelists and we appreciate that. And um, also I'd like to take a moment to um, thank uh, Karen Ryan of Social Techie. She's up there on the board. Um, Karen is one of our sponsors. She um, keeps me in line, helps um, us to all look good. She helps the panelists to look good. She does all the technical things. So um, if you have anything to direct, direct it in the chat to Karen. And Karen, I appreciate you very you. much. Um, this show was sponsored by Kennedy Donovan and the Department of developmental services, and they are also um, on the call uh, every week as well. And we look forward to having them and thank you for um, bringing the show to us. So let's get right to it. Um, I have a, a, a large group of panelists. We usually have four today. We have um, possibly five. I don't see the fifth one yet, but hopefully we will see that person. Um, and I just want to start with, um, our first guest, Josh Mason. Um, welcome and thank you for being here today. Josh um, is a candidate for state rep in the first Barnstable district. Um, he's here on the Cape with us and we thank you um, for you know, your service and what you're doing for the town. I just wanna give you a moment to introduce yourself um, and let everybody know about your candidacy. Sure, sure. Thank you for having me. It's really a, a pleasure to be here today. Um, so I appreciate the invite uh, to sit amongst uh, all these wonderful panelists today. Uh, my name is Josh Mason. I'm running for state representative in the first Barnesville district. Um, I am from I am from uh, Cape Cod. Uh, I originally I was born in Houston, Texas, but I grew up here. I moved here when I was five. Went through the public school system. Um, went to Hofstra University where I studied film production and lived in Los Angeles for a while working in the film and television industry. Uh, I, did move, I moved back to the Cape at, uh, let's see, 2010, uh, full time. I got into hospitality management and then worked my way into politics, uh, sitting on various committees in my town and in the county. Uh, I did run for, for the same position, state representative in 2018. Uh, I did lose the primary, but it was a great learning experience for me. Uh, and I am rearing to go again here in 2020. Um, and our agenda, it, it includes building a year-round sustainable economy for all Cape Codders and focusing on the year-round population uh, that is uh, you know, typically ignored by most. We, we live under a four-month-a-year economy, um, and it needs to be addressed. And people need to know that there are people that do reside here uh, year-round. So. Um, and then obviously we've got healthcare and public education and, and you know, the social justice issue that we're gonna to touch upon today. So there's so many uh, things to discuss and there's, there's only so much time. So anyway, I will pass the baton. I don't wanna eat up the time, but thank you. Appreciate being here today. I have a question for you. Um, you're, in your platform, you say that you wanna bring a new kind of politics, um, one that brings us together behind shared interests and bold ideas. And I just wanted to know if you can expound on that, what that means. Sure. So um, politics, obviously, as we know, it, it really started in 2008, 2009, the Tea Party movement. It was the sort of the anti-Obama movement um, within the Republican Party, which then eventually uh, morphed into Trumpism. Um, so we've, we've, we've gotten to a point um, in our democracy where we're either on one side or the other. So what I like to do is rather than, say, knocking on a door to introduce myself as a candidate, you know, you, you, a lot of people beg that question right out of the gate. Are you a D or an R? Well, before we get to what party persuasion I am, it's always good to introduce 
you know, have a nice little rapport about who I am, where I come from. Um, and then let's talk about something that concerns you uh, right now in the community. And let's maybe talk about where we can meet in the middle first and then work our way out. Um, I think too often uh, people start from one side and the other, it becomes a contentious argument out of the gate. Um, and then it's it, the conversation is literally in one ear and out the other. So I find it um, a better tactic to actually talk to people who have uh, commonalities uh, that they want to uh, discuss or something that concerns them. And that can typically spur a conversation and even uh, delete the uh, are you a Democrat or Republican question altogether. Um, and uh, it, it's wonderful because we all realize that we're people who are struggling and fighting for the same things. Thank you, Josh. Mm -hmm. um, could you guys all mute yourselves unless um, you are uh, talking? And I'd just like to acknowledge a few people that have joined us. Um, I see Michael Macenas. Um, he was a past panelist. I see Ayana Parent and um, the Reverend Will Levin. Um, I just want to acknowledge you all and don't be surprised if I call on you and I hope that you are uh, willing to share if I do. Um, our next guest, we have Wayne Earl Schinnick. He is the organizer of um, Black Lives Matter Sandwich. Um, it's a peaceful village that is held um, in Sandwich every Sunday evening. Um, and, you know, they have been kneeling in, um, in protest and in solidarity, I suppose, um, in, in honoring um, George Floyd and kneeling for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And I, I'm just intrigued, I don't know if anybody else is, that, um, you know, we talked about on this show uh, a couple of weeks ago, one of our guests, um, attorney Bruce Burns, he talked about the need to amplify the movement to keep things going and not let it die down. And I'm just so impressed with Wayne in your work that, um, that no matter what, um, you keep going. So can you just tell us a little bit about your why? Yeah, the why is pretty simple. Um, I moved to Cape Cod two and a half years ago. Um, I've lived in seven countries and I've, I've traveled to 44 countries and I've been all over. And uh, Cape Cod is um, excessively Caucasian, um, which is not where I expected to raise my child, wasn't expected where I, um, where I expected to live. Um, and I want to make sure that I raise my child or children, if we have more, in a way that's more open-minded. Um, and so we ended up going to a Black Lives Matter rally March uh, two and a half, three months ago in Falmouth, in which at the end, something like 250 people kneeled for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And it moved me. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do this every day for a week at some point during the day so that I experience what it is, let my brain go where it needs to go. And at the end of that week, I was like, you know what, I have to do something, no matter how small it is. And so I came up with the idea of a vigil. And you know, it's not a lot of people. I think the most we've had is 15 or 17 people. But we meet 15 minutes before dusk every Sunday and we kneel and then we list off another 10 names of black lives that have been lost in America due to violence. So it's real simple. Mm -hmm. That is so wonderful. You know, when I saw that you were doing that um, and you are a white male and, and, and I know Sandwich, right? I live in Mashpee. I've been on Cape for 30 some odd years and know Sandwich um, and its whiteness and its climate. Um, you know, there's um, a bigger issue there, I think, a, a social economic kind of um, you know, divide there as well as is race. And I saw that and I was just so, so impressed um, with that and wanting to, to come out and join you as well. I know that you've experienced um, at least a couple of um, events that were um, not so positive. And I'm yeah. just wondering if you'd like to just give us a little background on that. Well, really, there was only there was only one event in which we had um, a gentleman drive by and, and use the N word very loudly out the door and, and some curse words along with that. Um, I'm sad that we were unable to get the license plate because that's definitely um, a hate act um, of violence, in my opinion. Um, 
And the other, the only other thing that has occurred is I have definitely had some interesting um, negative retribution in the community that I live in. I'm the president of the homeowners association where I live, mm -hmm. um, and there has been some surprisingly negative um, opinions and gossip tree around me and me running the homeowners association because they feel that this is a political thing that I'm doing and not a, a um, human rights issue. So there's a lot of police officers in my neighborhood. There's a lot of Coast Guard. And they mm -hmm. seem to have a brotherhood that feels that what I'm doing is incorrect. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I can see where that can be a problem. That's why I was so um, intrigued by what you do. It takes a certain amount of bravery to stand up to what you believe in and what you feel is right. And I saw that you did a family trip recently and, and your daughter brought her portable Black Lives Matter sign. She, does, she has her little, I have a four and a half year old daughter and she has her little um, animals and, and stuffed animals. And she it was like, I wanna, I know this Black Lives Matter vigil is you know, after I go to bed, mm -hmm. but you know, as soon as it's not, I wanna join it. And so she really wanted to make a sign and she acts like she has a vigil with her, her little animals, which is pretty fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. Someone is asking in the chats, um, when do you meet again and uh, what is your location? So really easy. It's the Sandwich Public Library. Mm -hmm. um, and it's every Sunday, 15 minutes before dusk. So you can look that up or you can do like this Sunday, it's at 6 p.m. And then next Sunday, it's at 550. And then it's at um, 540. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it changes to be 15 minutes before dusk so that we kneel at dusk every Sunday. Perfect. And there's um, one more question. Um, do you feel safe in what you're doing? Um, thus far, I would say that, yeah, we feel safe. Um, I am definitely aware um, and a little more worried since that one incident two weeks ago, somebody driving by um, mm -hmm. to, I kind of keep my eyes open a little bit more, but when we're kneeling, we've all got our head down and we're in our own zone doing our own thing. And if something happens and that's, that's, I think the reality of it and we're persevering with what we're doing. So. Oh, I just want to ask our panelists um, individually, um, maybe a couple of you, uh, when you hear Black Lives Matter, what that means to you um, as, a, as a, a concept, Black Lives Matter, My Life Matters, or as a movement. Um, when you hear that, what does that mean to you? Um, I'm going to go to you first, Jim. Okay. Um Black Lives Matter to me, there should be an appendage to it that, that says also or two, you know, because I'm a firm believer that all lives matter, but over the, the recent history here in, in America in relationship to the police and, and unarmed black people, it seems that there has been uh, a, a lessening of the value of life of black people in particular. So I think that it, 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 the, the concept of Black Lives Matter throws some spotlight on that particular issue, but it's so broad in that it should be all inclusive that all lives matter, but blacks have seemed to have been relegated to a less than important value of life to the general society. You know, it, it's almost as if, if we don't have an incident like the George Floyd incident, which was so obviously and brazenly uh, a, a disregard for black human life. If we don't have that, it's almost as if people don't believe that there's an issue. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's as if, uh, that could not happen uh, here in America. That could not happen here in Falmouth. That could not happen here in Massachusetts. But the truth is that if we don't take the bullhorn and, 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 and have the, uh, the, the, the video cameras to have evidence of this, then it goes by the wayside. So the whole Black Lives Matter uh, concept of the, raising the issue was I think so very important to just raise the awareness of everybody that all lives matter, not just black lives, but that all lives matter and we be, need to be included in that conversation. 
Thank you, Jim. Reverend, do you mind if I ask you the same question? Um, you have your little t-shirt hanging up in the background. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to ask you, when you hear Black Lives Matter, what does that mean to you? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be with you again, Marie, and uh, hello to all of the, the panelists today. BLM for me is about trying to once and for all eliminate what has occurred in this country since its inception, which is to see other human beings through the lens of race. Uh, so I have a little diff different opinion on this from uh, Jim, who just spoke. Um, we are promoting the fact that Black Lives Matter because, and I liken it to this, if you, uh, if you live in a community and you have a, a house and uh, your house is on fire uh, and you call your local fire department, uh, in that particular moment, your house matters more than all the other houses in your community because your house is on fire. Or if you go into a uh, emergency room in a hospital and uh, you're there because uh, you have sprained your ankle playing basketball or soccer or something, and someone else comes into the emergency room and they are ble bleeding profusely from an automobile accident or some other trauma, uh, guess whose life matters more in that moment? Uh, you would be very upset if the attention was given to the person with the sprained ankle and not given to you if you happen to be the one who was having a traumatic experience. So that for me is what the BLM, what the Black Lives Matter movement is all about, is trying to focus attention on the fact that, yes, as a person of the cloth, as a priest in the Episcopal Church, I know that all of God's creatures, all of God's creation matters. But right now, because of the realities in our nation, uh, Black Lives Matter is an attempt to put a focus on the fact that lives that have been demeaned and devalued, as Jim said, are family value and given uh, meaning and respect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to bring on our next guest, um, Karen Wong. Karen is a business owner, a photographer, and she is also a member of Prejudice Free Duxbury. Um, I just thank you for coming on, Karen. Um, I, I love the work in your voice that you lend um, to your community and um, the, the community at large. You know, you just seem to stand, um, you, you and your husband, your family, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, just the title of the organization that you are belong to, members of Prejudice Free Duxbury, that sounds like a lofty goal. <laughs> Can you um, just give us uh, a little background on that, enlighten us? I, I will. Um, thank you so much for having me, Marie. Um, I don't know, do you want a little background on who I am, or do you want me just to dive right into prejudice? Well, you can both, both, please. Um, well, I am from Los Angeles. I heard, uh, I think, some, uh, uh, oh, uh, Somebody, uh, Wayne was from Los Angeles or Josh. Josh. Um, but I've been in Duxbury. My family moved to Duxbury about 21 years ago. Um, I'm a Jewish woman married to a, chi a Chinese immigrant. He's from Hong Kong, who was a US Army veteran uh, after serving 20 years in the Army. Um, our son is active duty in the Air Force, actually. So Duxbury is not exactly a diverse town. Mm -hmm. Uh, not too many black people, Chinese or Jews, but uh, we've managed to work it out here. And Prejudice Free Duxbury is actually a new, a new group that's under the umbrella of the Duxbury Rotary Club and the Interfaith Council, the Duxbury Interfaith Council. And I do think that George Floyd's murder was just an extreme wake up call that came admittedly way too late, but it struck a nerve across the country and certainly in Duxbury. And uh, I had been very busy uh, doing some, uh, working on a coalition that was really more about uh, mental health and substance abuse and had taken a step back from the Duxbury Rotary Club actually. But 
members of the Duxbury Rotary Club wrote a letter saying that we need to make a difference in this town. We need to make Duxbury our goal. It needs to be prejudice free. Racism might be right now sort of the big focus, but whether it be uh, LGBTQ issues, religious persecution, you know, women's issues, it, whatever the, the prejudice, there's so many. Um, and so I came to them right when I saw that and said, yes, I wanted to organize uh, some kind of a rally in town. I thought it would be really important to get the whole community together in a peaceful way to try to, you know, tackle these issues. And so kind of a long story short, we reached out to the Interfaith Council and combined. And uh, we did have an event. It was a challenging event to actually, Marie doesn't realize it, but she was really part of the inspiration. Uh, I kept seeing, listen to my stories. And I thought that's what we need to hear because there are, even though it's a predominantly white town, there are people of color here who've experienced a lot. And I think for many, more what we would think progressive white people not really realizing what it is to be in those shoes. I, you know, have been married to my husband for 30 years and I can tell you the racism against Chinese people since 2016 has been just un unexpectedly harsh. Mm -hmm. And so I can only then imagine how much worse it is for uh, the black people in our community. And I really love what Reverend, Reverend uh, Mibane said, Mabin, I'm not, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. I, I think your analogy and your visualization of right now, the black, that, that one house, that one particular, you know, black people's homes are literally on fire right now. That's not to say that other people's houses don't matter, but we really need to direct attention. Um, in that direction. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really excited to be part of this organization, um, this group, uh, and it's, it's a very big cross section. Our first event, which ended up being virtual, had leaders from the business community, the police chief spoke, mm -hmm. interfaith. We had a number of people just tell their personal stories. Sadly, um, a number of people said they wanted to tell their stories, but they're not ready. And you can't push, you just, it's gonna be a slow process. We're just trying to reach out to, whether it be the library, the senior center, the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society, all coming together to do different programming. We, we realize this is, this is a long, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint and it's gonna take years to get there, but we're committed to moving in that direction. Thank you, Karen. Thanks for sharing. Um, and thank you. I'm glad to know that I had a little bit of inspiration. Um, I think we are all an inspiration to each other. And that's why we bring this platform together to share information um, and resources and to have the conversation. Um, Josh, I just want to direct a question to you. In this climate, um, where we hear Black Lives Matter and we hear Blue Lives Matter. I know the question on this show week after week, and we haven't had anyone to answer that question, but um, the message of Blue Lives Mattering, you know, people want to know what, what is a blue life and what does that mean um, to people? I see you have some certification in citizen police, um, you know, in, 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 on Cape Cod and also, when you have to, when you talk about um, serving and you know for all right and in bringing some unity around um, the issues that you have to confront, how do you manage even in the time of your in your candidacy um, those two different concepts you know blue life matter black life matter the tribalism that that happens how do, how do you manage that so um... Yeah, so I work in sort of an auxiliary, uh, I guess, uh, aspect, if you will, with respect to the police. Um, I, I did the Community Citizens Police Academy uh, about a year and a half ago, and then 
uh, just to be more in touch with what they do and, and the inner workings and operational stuff uh, within the police force and also building those relationships a little bit more. Um, but what it led to was working on the crisis intervention team, which deals with substance use and mental health in the community. And I'm so, so glad that our department, it's really a model department, actually has a program like that um, to provide to the community. And they really emphasize uh, community policing, which I think is a really important aspect to solving this crisis that is the BLM movement. Um, you know, I don't see as much division and um, I guess racial injustice, if you will, in my town. Um, not to say that it's not throughout the community, but at least in the town of Dennis, where I reside, the, the police department here does a pretty good job. Um, but with respect to the whole blue lives, black lives question, uh, you know, being a police officer is a job. It's a job that you have chosen to take upon yourself. And, and um, I appreciate, and I know we all appreciate, um, our officers heroically putting their lives in the line day in and day out for us to protect us and to serve us. However, there are abuses of power within a minority of law enforcement officials. We do know that there has been an FBI report that they, they uh, certified that white supremacy groups and state militias have infiltrated our law enforcement communities. Um, that changes sort of the philosophy and the ideology from within. That's dangerous because, you know, it's really the white supremacy groups that are even more dangerous than the ISIS or the radical uh, Islamic groups, uh, terrorist groups that are out there um, because it's a, it's a cancer from within. And it's, it, it's, it's almost like a, a cult, if you will, uh, a cult against cu a culture, if you will. Um, but we can't really, you can't really uh, compare a job to um, a lot, I, I guess, a racial identity, because racial identity is not a choice. A job is a choice. Um, and it's, I, I think it's a disservice to try to compare the two, honestly. Um, and the Black Lives Matter movement um, is really not about giving someone more or less. It's really just creating a culture in which, uh, or a situation in which everybody has the same privileges. Um, so we've, I don't know, I, I feel like there's sort of a, a blurred line there between the two. And, and one wants to say that uh, if you're, if you're pro-Black Lives Matter, you're anti-police. And I don't see it that way because I have relationships with law enforcement officials and there are a lot of really wonderful police out there who are doing the job by the book and doing it well. Um, it's just going to take a lot of work in changing the culture, um, how we hire our police officers, uh, maybe implementing a program in which there's more diversity within the departments in which we hire. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, really emphasizing the de-escalation uh, aspect of it, less criminalization and more community policing. I mean, I think that's, that's sort of a blueprint to start from and foundationally we can work off of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Josh. Um, please send, okay, please send me your questions and if you have something to add to that conversation, please raise your hands. I'd love to hear from you. Karen. Yeah, I have a, a question. Um, I could use some help on right now. I'm going to stay very calm. I, I'm usually really good about staying calm, but uh, my hackles have really gotten up lately. Um, I spoke very briefly. I just met Josh a couple minutes before the session started, and I'm actually working as a volunteer on a campaign for our current state rep, uh, Josh Cutler in the Plymouth 6th District, um, who's been very popular. Uh, he's a Democrat. He's been very bipartisan. Uh, is from this district and has done, I'm not even gonna give you the laundry list, it's too long and it's, it's too awesome. But um, a candidate was dropped in to our district who is not from here. She moved here a year ago and she has stirred up in the last couple weeks a hatred that I cannot believe. Um, and she is, she's a one issue candidate, it's all police. Um, she's spreading lies about um, Josh, our Josh voting to defund the police department, which he did not do. And it is turned unbelievably ugly and nasty um, from her side. And a, a lot of things have been dug up about her, her past, uh, which are very ugly. And how we had, with Prejudice Free Duxbury, one of the things that was important to us when we started this group, which was before uh, this opponent 
came into town was to really have, we felt that we wanted to be with the police. We wanted the police on our side so we could work together as a community because Black Lives Matter, police lives, all, all lives do matter, but Black Lives Matter, you know, Black Lives Matter. And we needed the police to be on board with that. And we seem to be moving in the right direction um, with the police chief, who's a new chief. But um, the police union just endorsed Josh's opponent. Mm -hmm. And it is causing so much ugliness. And I want to be open. And the police chief may have like tried to get his officers not to go that way and stay neutral, but they did what they did. Mm -hmm. And I'm having a really hard time reconciling this. Um, and I admire our candidate. He, he wants to stay above the fray. He's not, he's not going there. He's got some great endorsements. But how, how do we manage this going forward? Because I want to be able to work with the police and the community, but right now it's very hard, hard to, to have this trust. So um, I'm going to, are you talking to Josh or are you just asking generally? I'm asking um, generally like how, like we need to oh. heal, you know, at the, after this election, we have to live together in these towns. And I think it's important. We need, we're not going to ever get where we want to go mm -hmm. if we stay divided in our silos. Well, I'm going to answer first, even though I'm the moderator. And my answer would be, you have conversations that matter. You know, you, you, you keep the conversation alive. And, and Jim, I want to, you, you're raising your hand? Yes. Oh, I want to yes. just weigh in on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Something came out of the uh, debate last night. And uh, that probably eluded a lot of people that there is an effort to eliminate sensitivity training and stuff like that within the police forces and within uh, uh, other institutions. You know, I've traveled this whole country. You know, I wrote my autobiography and it, it, it kind of encompassed my whole life and that of a black man uh, in America. Uh, jumping through hoops and hurdles and whatever else to become successful at some point. Okay, what I've noticed or appreciated from my own perspective was that people don't really get a chance to know each other. You know, I've traveled this country in particular and there were people out in the, the Midwest or the, the Far West or the Northwest that never come into contact with African Americans, with black people, you know? So they have no idea whatsoever about the sensibilities, about the frustrations, about what it means to live life in America as a minority individual, especially a, a black person. Over the course of the time that I've been here in Massachusetts, since let's say the turn of the century, I've noticed that there have been some very positive groups that have propped up No Place for Hate, eventually Black Lives Matter, uh, your program, let's, let's have a, uh, let me tell you my story. These are opportunities to get some sensitivity about how other people not like yourself are grappling with problems and issues and what's their perspective. Most people don't have a clue what Black Lives Matter means to Black people. They're seeing it from the perspective of uh, it's, it's something radical, it's a, a, a departure from uh, uh, being peaceful, uh, it's a, a demanding kind of situation, when in reality, if we become part of some all-inclusive kind of group like No Place for Hate or like you're trying to do in, in Duxbury. Uh, if we become a part of that, we get a chance to see and walk in somebody else's shoes and then we can have a, a better appreciation for what it takes for the whole community to come together. I believe in, in regard to the police that the police should live in close proximity to the places that they police. 
You know, I think that there should be a sensitivity about the inhabitants of the community in which they police. You know, uh, that that's a step in the right direction. Uh, I'm hoping that people like Josh, people who are uh, actively engaged in trying to change the political landscape, are more in tune with sensitivity and the, and the whole idea that everybody's sensitivity awareness needs to be raised. Black people are just as confused and, and uh, about white people as white people are about black people. Until a conversation gets started, until we can actually interact from a, a, a safe and sane perspective, nothing is going to be accomplished, you know? So sensitivity and sensitivity training and, and, and awareness, I think are critical in how we go forward. Thank you, Jim. I forgot to mention that Jim is um, an author. He has a book, a great book, his autobiography. It is called um, Metamorphosis in Black. And I just encourage you, if you'd like a copy, just contact Jim or myself and we can make sure you have one. Um, there are some really powerful voices on this call who aren't part of our panelists. And I'd love for you to share if I ask um, that of you, if you feel comfortable. Um, uh, if not, that's okay too. But I, I just appreciate you guys coming back, Jessica, Ayana, Francis, Michael, um, and others that you know come in here to um, support us. Um, this show was entitled, Is It Really Justice for All? And what was heavy on my mind and the mind of people who contacted me um, this particular week was the Breonna Taylor um, verdict, if you will, you know, the, the, you know, the um, attorney general coming on and, and giving us the outcome of that case. Um, it was really, for me, anticlimactic, um, and it there were some things about what he said um, that really um, hit me to a point where I couldn't breathe, I I couldn't talk for a while, and I I really shed a tear, very rarely, and I did. I couldn't look at my son for a good hour when he came in from school. Um, you know, I call it trauma, just repeatedly being traumatized um, as, a, as a black person, a black woman in particular who um, has raised black sons, that um, it, I would never utter the words, my life does not matter. However, I heard a lot of people saying, I guess my life doesn't matter you know, particularly, young, you know, posting on Facebook or saying, um, because that's what that sentence said to them. It, it was really traumatic. Um, Ayana, I know you're driving, but can you share your, can you share at all your expertise um, around the area of trauma? Have you seen more people reach out to you? Um, Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Oh, okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's super heavy. I had the same experience you did about um, the Brianna thing. And um, sorry, I'm driving, so I'm trying to multitask here. Um, it's super heavy. And I think, you know, I got a lot of messages, and thank you for posting that and just letting people know that I'm here, because I am. I always am. Um, you know, it, the verdict really did communicate in a lot of ways um, that black lives don't matter and that um, particularly black women's lives don't matter. And um, that was super hard. Um, blessings here, my daughter's here. She's saying hello. And um, <laughs> here, bless, you can jump in. I'm gonna finish this conversation. Um, so I think it's heavy for everybody. Um, and I, you know, my, of course my thing is always breath and movement and mindfulness, but I think it's also education. So I've been having a lot of conversations this week. I know you guys have mentioned the police, but with just police on Cape Cod and in general, um, just to see if they understand the depths in which the system really is infected by racism. 
Um, and I think a lot of them aren't as aware um, about the system stuff that you would think. And, um, and so the, the more education and, and, and conversations that I can have, um, and I love Josh's point, he's my buddy, um, just about, you gotta have those conversations regardless of the you know, opposite Republican, Democrat kind of thing. Um, but if I can affect sort of change in that way that I'm willing to do that um, and also just help heal people. Cause it, it's, it's so heavy. Like I didn't, I went away for a week by myself. <laughs> Cause it was, I had to take some restoration for myself because I do so much social action and social justice. So I don't, you know, in order for me to keep going, I have to make sure that myself is taken care of. Um, but yeah, those are my thoughts. Yeah. You know, I, I had a period where I, I just, I posted on social media, check on your black friends because we're not okay. You know, it, it, it's hard and it hurts. And I think that um, people need to know um, that, um, you know, it's just, it's just not a, a movement. Our, our lives are, they do matter in the lives of those that we love, as well as all of, all of you, all of our friends and our community members matter to us as well. Joanne, you asked if you could comment. I would love to hear you comment. Hi, I'm Joanne Treisman from Falmouth, formerly of the Affirmative Action Diversity Committee. Um, I, I'm commenting to Karen. Um, I hear what you're saying. I've been part of, and I know Mar Marie Stevenson as well, we've been part of the conversations with the chiefs of police on Cape Cod. Um, and one of the things that keeps coming up, and I think it's a very powerful, is to consider pushing for community um, review boards over the police. So that, the, so that the community has some input. Yes, the union is there. Yes, the union is strong. And again, if you've got union members that are moving in one direction and they're not to be moved otherwise or they're influencing the, the members, you, you know, you, what can you do? But if you have a community review board, it can at least be a place where there can be conversation with ordinary citizens and the ordinary patrol people get out of the hierarchy of who's making decisions about what. So that was the comment I wanted to make. I think that it's something that all of our communities should start to think about doing, making sure that there's oversight, um, that there's communication. Mm -hmm. May I respond to that? Sure. sure. Um, thank you, Joanne. Um, interesting that you mentioned that because what really started this firestorm was uh, there was some recent police reform that was voted on at the state house. And that there is a part, and I can't give you the exact name, but it basically is having oversight. And that is what set the police off on this, tan on this tear. They, they, they like to call it defunding, it's not defunding. But what they really don't want is any outside oversight. Right. So respectfully, the last thing I would do is say that our community should do that. But what I'm wondering is what Josh Mason mentioned that was very scary earlier in this conversation, which is that some maybe agitator, rights, white supremacy type of groups are trying to infiltrate the, the police department because that is... I, that actually kind of scares me. And I think maybe there might be a little part of that going on here. So circling back to what everybody else was, was recommending, which is more conversations, which is normally my nature. I'm just really, I'm really angry and I'm, I'm hurt. I feel like my back was stabbed by this vote. Um, maybe it's not the ch chief that we need to talk to, it's having the conversation with the rank and file police officers and having them get to know us. Not so much, not in that the way like we're gonna be reviewing you, but let's get to know each other mm -hmm. a little better. And maybe we can relationship out some of those um, white supremacy tendencies. I mean, I know that's like pie in the sky. And I, the reason why I've taken it so personally is uh, as part of Duxbury Facts, which is an anti-addiction and mental health coalition, that I was a founding member of, 
we spent a lot of time working with the police department and we have a crisis intervention team that has now integrated the whole Plymouth County and it's amazing. And I'm psyched to hear that you're doing it on the Cape too. I, I don't mean to take up too much time. So mm -hmm. I like Joanne's idea. I think the conversation is good, but in a less threatening, not oversighty way. <laughs> at this I, point. Think, I think we all can agree that um, conversation, right? When we share um, our thoughts, right? In a, in a non-threatening way that we, um, agree on some some ground rules, unlike last night's debate, that we agree to disagree, we agree to share our truths, we agree to share um, some information, because that's important, <laughs> the conversation should be some information, some facts, some things that people can read um, to learn more. Um, our friend Jessica Ellis Wilson, who um, has been on our panel, in the past, uh, she does some work around anti-bias. She shared that conversations are so key. Uncomfortable conversations are where the seeds of smoke happen. And, and I agree. Um, we have someone who's not muted, I think. Yeah, so um, uncomfortable conversations are where the seeds of growth happen. And, and, and that is true. Sometimes we have to call upon those people in our community that um, may disagree with us and ask, can I talk to you? I know I've had, um, and I will have more, several conversations with police chiefs across um, the Cape. I've spent a lot of time creating um, relationships with police officers well before um, some of these things were amplified. So I am able to pick up the phone and or them to me um, to have conversations. And, and that's important. I just want to introduce um, our last panelist. Um, she, she logged on, she had some uh, meetings. And um, her name is Jamila um, Carter. Uh, full disclosure, she is my sister. And she is um, an administrator and director of preschool at Jubilee Christian uh, School. It's a private school of predominantly African-American children in um, Philadelphia. Um, so I, I wanna switch over to the debates and we have, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes or so. I, I do book the show to 515 to be safe, just so you know. And um, I just wanna switch over to the debates last night, the elephant in the room, because we didn't spend any time talking about it. Um, before we logged on, we had a brief conversation. And one of the things we talked about is children were watching. And Jamila is an educator, she educates children um, up until I believe fifth or sixth grade. And she has, she's a mom of teenage um, and a college student. Um, and you know, what do you say to children in this climate, Jamila, particularly if they were watching last night? Um, uh, you know what? Uh, thanks for having me and hello everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a good question. And I always, especially with younger children, if they happen to watch, which I especially right now would not recommend, um, I try to find out what they know first you know, and try to get them to talk about what they've seen, um, how they feel about it, and work from there, you know, just kind of meet them where they are. So I'm thinking about my teenage children, and, um, you know, they watch everything, they hear everything, and we just have frank discussions. And you know, I share with them what my feelings are on the topic and, um, you know, just allow them to share. From In my family, what we try to do is just instill, you know, a sense of pride in them so they know where they're, where they, who they are. So when they see these things that are ugly and can be traumatic, they're, they're pretty, they're insulated, you know, they're, they're strong. They understand what's going on. They understand that there are people in the world who just don't have, um, don't approach situations with empathy, you know, that see, don't see the humanity in everyone. 
And we talk about that. We just talk about feelings. We talk about how things can be traumatic and we just work from a place of healing. Thank you, Jamila. Thank you for sharing. Wayne, I want to ask you um, the same question. Uh, basically, what was your reaction to it? Did you watch, first of all, and what was your reaction to last night's debate? I listened to probably 30% of it, watched about 20% of it. Um, and I usually am kind of addicted to intaking way too much political information. Um, I have to say, I mean, I only have a four and a half year old. I can't imagine exposing anyone under the age of 10 to um, these types of events. Um, my biggest thing that I keep thinking about lately is the fact that there is a lack of interest and accountability. And I think that every time we listen to Trump, we see that. And I think that because he has been promoting a lack of accountability and that that's okay, that's actually part of the issue with why there's this big separation occurring with police unions and Black Lives Matter. It's like, nope, we don't want accountability. And yes, you have to be held accountable. And I think that part of my conversation, because I've actually worked with photographing police departments for five plus years now, and with PARI, Police Addiction Recovery, in New England and DC and New York, et cetera, is why have this reciprocity failure? Why not understand that good police officers good police officers and good chiefs want accountability, just like a good surgeon wants accountability. Every job wants proper accountability and proper people to do the right job properly. So that's the conversation I keep having with people, hoping that they'll listen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Josh, I just wanna ask you, um, that being said, accountability, um, I know that the question of qualified immunity is on the table and you know it's being voted on and discussed and things and I just want to know what your um, position is on that. Um, so I'm I'm a uh, I'm a staunch supporter of the um, abolition of qualified immunity. Um, my my girlfriend's a teacher, a third grade teacher, and she's part of a union, and she doesn't get qualified immunity if if a, a child accuses her of holding, grabbing their wrist wrong, or yelling at her, or you know, um, police unions are the only unions that have that um, that ability. So, with respect to qualified immunity, you know, I've looked at good and hard targeted qualified immunity for good officers, but. I feel like that is too difficult to manage. I don't think there's really a way to do that. Um, there's certainly loopholes sort of in waiting if we, if we go that route. So I think just the, the um, absolute ab abolition of it is the way to go because what we've done is incentivize bad behavior. You're saying that you can get away with anything, we're gonna protect you no matter what. Their counter argument is, well, it saves us money in the long term because then we don't have to deal with costly lawsuits within different townships and jurisdictions and yada yada. Um, I think if we do away with it all together, um, our law enforcement officials should be held uh, accountable um, the same way that anyone else is. Um, and they should not have uh, absolution in power uh, to be able to get away with or do uh, whatever they choose. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, this has been going on for a long time, for decades. It's just now we have camera phones and security cameras and, and now we can, we can document it and call them out. I mean, there, there, there's journalists on TV that get pushed to the ground and police lie and say, oh, it didn't happen. It's like, well, we just, we got it on film. It's right here. Um, so this is, this is a, a taught behavior, a learned behavior, and something that has become enmeshed in the police culture, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a minority of officers uh, that are sort of um, stoked under this, this, this guise of bad behavior, if you will. Um, I think the majority of them are good officers and are doing the right thing. But we, you know, you don't want the, the, the minority to ruin it for everyone. And, I, and personally, I think uh, accountability is extremely important. We have Josh's um... important when you give someone a gun and a badge and the power of the law at times. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I, I think we need to strip that, uh, you know, the, the qualified I immunity mean, absolutely needs to go away. Mm -hmm. and last night during the debates, debates, there was some really you know, heavy things said. Um, one thing that um, Trump said was, all the police are backing me. You know, true or not, he made that statement loud and clear. And um, that being said, <laughs> um, I, I just wanna know if anybody has any thoughts on, or, or how they felt if they heard that, um, what, what did that say to you? 
Um, Reverend Mevin, do you want to talk about that? If did you see the debates at all? I watched the um, first 16, 17 minutes of it, and then I had to leave the room. Mm -hmm. and I came back a few minutes later, and and I watched for ten minutes or so, and I had to leave the room. And then finally, I just gave up, and uh, I thought it was uh, an embarrassment for the nation, for the office of the presidency, uh, for human beings. Mm -hmm. um, I was very, very, very uh, disappointed. Not surprised uh, that the, the president uh, made that uh, comment. We know that it is not true. I work with police officers, uh, have worked with police officers, who uh, would not, who do not support uh, his policies and do not support him. Um, but I do want to say, in response to your question, Marie, about is there a justice for all, which relates to policing, uh, the the answer to that is absolutely not, and it is one of the reasons that I personally stopped saying the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, probably thirty or forty years now. Uh, because it ends with, with liberty and justice for all. And that is just a bold faced lie. And so I'm not going to stand with my hand over my heart and uh, profess allegiance to something that is, uh, that is not true. So I share that with uh, the panelists and uh, others and you. Mm -hmm. Marie. Oh, yes. Yeah, I just so I didn't hear that statement last night. Um, you know that all of the police back me that he said, but what I what when you said that, it it re literally brought up a feeling for me as a black woman, as a person raising a black son, black children, and we already know the fractured relationship that the black community has with the police you know, whether or not they're majority good or whatever people may feel or think. But um, that kind of just reinforces it. So if he said, if we have this fractured relationship with the police and he says, they all back me. As a black woman, what I'm hearing again is it's just reinforcing my belief that the police don't have the best interest and, and my best interest is at heart. People that look like me, you know, and that um, I feel more in danger and more vulnerable. And so I think when we have these conversations about good and bad police, if that's the case, if the majority are good, I'm just gonna be honest, we don't see that. We don't feel that. You know, I am, um, have never been in any legal trouble. Whenever there's a cop car behind me, I immediately feel fear. I'm immediately feeling like, Am I doing everything right? Did I use my turn signal? If I'm stopped, what is this interaction going to, how is this interaction going to end? I was 15 years old and thrown into a jail cell because there, a fight broke out at a party and I couldn't get to a cell phone faster. Uh, not a cell phone, they weren't cell phones. I'm not that young. Um, but I couldn't get to the pay phone fast enough and the police wanted to clear the area. We were teenagers with no way to get home. We were in the suburbs, we lived in Boston, we didn't have rides, our parents brought us. And so their answer to that was to call the police department, to call the fire department, to bring, to bring police dogs. You know, so these, these are real things that we've gone through. And I think, you know, we just really have to be honest. And, I've, and one of the things that I'm always asking for from people, white people, is empathy. You may not have been through it. You don't have to, you know, walk in my shoes, but we're just asking for a little bit of empathy. And that's all I'm going to say about that. I, I agree with you 100%, Jamila. I, when I heard that last night, I literally felt terrified for every Black person in, in this country. It was, it was scary as heck, that, and of course, the call to arms for white supremacists. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of reiterate, there was a comment that Jessica made, um, who's here, you know, about saying that, yeah, good cops just stay quiet. Even if they're, if they're in the majority, but they stay quiet, 
they're, they're just as much part of the problem. So I just, I agree. I'm not sure which one of you is Jennifer, but I thought that was a really good comment. Marie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, I, this is Council, Council Deborah Dagwan. Oh, hi, Deborah. How are you? I'm would good. You, I just, would you, would you uh, like to share? Yeah. Can you introduce yourself in your title and um, then feel free? Uh, yes, my name is Deborah Dagwan, and I'm a uh, Barnstable Town Counselor, and I represent Precinct 8 here um, in, Bar in the town of Barnstable. And I just wanted to comment on a couple of things that, that I heard uh, some of your uh, spokespeople talking about. And one, the individual just spoke about feeling nervous when a police officer gets behind you. Um, that happens to a lot of us of color. Um, also, the individual that uh, spoke about uh, the good cops being quiet. And my, my feeling on that issue is that I think we need to stop focusing on who the negative cops are and recognize the good cops. Somehow we've got to elevate them. I think a lot of them are quiet because they're in a very dangerous profession. And, um, and just like on your job, you know, you're a little leery about saying certain things around certain people, but I think some way we have to find a way to elevate them. Um, it also came to mind that about a group called a, um, we have a unity day here on the Cape, and it came about from a, young, a group of young black men. Um, they're called people of action. And they do it every year, but because of the COVID, it will probably not occur. It didn't occur this year. But they were the ones who brought together the community and police officer, law enforcement, on a unity day. And they did that because there was so much, I'm going to try to do this quickly. There was so much controversy going on um, around the country, around the nation, between black males and police officers. And they wanted to try to... Uh, bring the two together here on the Cape. And so it's a, it's a wonderful group. They're, they're, they'd be a great group to try to expand upon, you know, the uh, recognizing some of our uh, police officers. Because as, as Josh was saying earlier, there's some great cops out there and we know them, uh, black and white. And we need to try to find a way to elevate those or at least mention them, find a way to to mention those who we, we've come in contact with that's given us a smile, who's been, talked to us politely when, when they interact with us. That's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm, I, I like. And I, most of them, some of the ones that I've found are, are, don't even interact with you. They, they can't smile at you. They don't talk to you nicely or whatever, for whatever reason. I also, someone spoke about um, check on your black friends because they are not okay. And I, I felt just like the, the sister spoke about, she had to step away. She did, not because of the debate last night, just because of all the stuff that's been going on. My stomach's been turning. My heart has been hurting over what I'm hearing. I'm hurt. I'm not angry, but I'm just hurt. And the hurt just keeps coming. So you have to step away from it and just clear your mind. Mm -hmm. And I feel, I'd, I'd like to see, I'm not a great writer, but I'd like to um, team up with somebody, maybe you, Maria, somebody, and let's do an article in the paper that says, check on your, on your minority friends or your black friends, because they are not okay. Mm -hmm. I think people need to know that. And to me, when she said that, I said, that would be a great article for the newspaper to write something. Mm -hmm. um, because I think people need to know how we feel. We're not angry. Right mm -hmm. now, some, of, some probably are. We are hurt. So I just wanted to throw that out there if anybody's interested in doing anything like that. And that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Deborah. I'm so glad that you are on. I've known Deborah for years. She was a, a teacher um, of my uh, middle son, Dane. Um, you know, we are all making such good points and I don't want to um, negate what Jamila said um, uh, or what I said that the, the, the trauma is real, right? The, the pain, the hurt, the fear, um, is real. We're not going to yield to it, right? Um, but it, but it is real, and it needs to be acknowledged. Um, 
Wayne says in our chats that it will be very difficult to elevate good police officers when we still have such a strong brotherhood of officers, basically a fraternity that enforces togetherness and self-protection in general over the true good and society um, and the community they serve. Uh, there are some amazing model community police departments that I have worked with but it is a long road. We have to be strong. Thank you, Wayne, for your, um, your, your comment. And Michael says, very hard thing to do. I feel like good cops are afraid of standing up against the bad apples. Therefore, um, they want to be quiet. Um, again, I, I, I appreciate platforms like this. Um, I wish more diverse voices will come on and I need to step out of my comfort zone and invite them on. Um, you know, we, we're having a conversation, we're not having a debate. And I think sometimes people feel um, that they will be challenged or attacked. And like Jessica said, sometimes it is a hard conversation to get to um, the common good, to get some work done. So it, it's worth giving a try. I, I will do that and, and try to get some more um, diverse voices, particularly, um, police officers. My, my husband is um, a former police officer and sheriff's department, um, department um, guard, so to speak, whatever you call them. Um, and also my father-in-law was uh, a Boston police officer for 18 years. So, you know, and we are a um, multiracial family. So, you know, we have these conversations in our own home and they're not easy right? This climate has, has caused some um, division, particularly from my end, because I come from a place of hurt, right? And, and sometimes he just doesn't see it or get it. And I expected a certain reaction. So I think that um, we should continue to have these conversations, continue to bring our questions to the table to continue to invite our friends to the conversations and continue to validate each other's thoughts and have some empathy for it. Jamila, can you just close us out with um, a story that you told me earlier about um, a little bit of equity and justice that you were giving me an example of uh, a child who was a, a really good example of um, showing um, some justice. I hope I get this right. Um, and this story, I, I, I heard the story on NPR, This American Life, and it was a, a comedian, a black comedian who was just, it was an anecdote about something he had been through as a child. And he was um, around 12 years old in middle school. And there was a favorite teacher who had, they called it a bank and it was just play money that the children could earn to um, buy trinkets, um, you know, candy, pencils, whatever. So they got these, these, this play money for good deeds or for good grades or what have you. So he had figured out that, um, that children that were in her homeroom were raking in the dough basically. And he only had one class with her. He had a math class. So he's looking around like my pockets are flat but everybody else, you know, they're, they're balling. They're making a whole lot of money. And, you know, this just isn't fair because they had more time with this teacher. So they were able to earn more money. So he goes to the teacher and he says, you know, um, this isn't fair. Basically, these children, and he didn't, what, didn't use this terminology, but they're, they're privileged. They have more time with you. So the teacher's response was, work harder. You know, um, if you want to make more money, you have to do better. You have to be better than them. And, you know, he just was like, this is, imp it's impossible. The, you know, that it's just not equitable. So he went to his last resort, which was to 12-year-old him rob the bank. So he basically go climbs in a window, robs the bank, and then he gets, um, found out he gets punished but the result of that was the teacher finally listened she said hey you know this wasn't fair 
And so she leveled the playing field. She said, you know, the only way you can earn this money is if you're in during the math hour, regardless of whether you're in my homeroom or not. So I just, that, that story really stuck with me because I think it's sometimes hard for people to understand this systemic racism or this lack of a level playing field. And this was just clear, it was plain as day. And so it just, um, it's just something I think that, especially as a black woman, you know, we, I've, I've heard it over and over again, you have to be three times better than everyone else to be where they are. And that's just simply not fair. And so another thing that stuck out about the story was the children who were the privileged children, they were not happy that the, the playing field had been leveled. They were irate and they couldn't understand. But one of the things that, um, you know, I thought about, again, we come back to empathy. They hadn't been in the other children's shoes, so they couldn't empathize. And no one who has privilege and has, you know, um, a leg up wants to share. A lot of people don't want to share that. They don't want to give that up. That feels threatening. So I just thought that was just a powerful story. And it was really parallel to some of what we see in America right now. And I just think it, it can explain a lot to people who may not understand. Thank you, Jamila. I, I have a saying, I always say power and privilege is a cunning thing, you know, um, nobody wants to yield that. I want to thank our um, panelists today and invite you to join us again sometimes. I want to thank Josh Mason. He is the candidate for um, first candidate for um, state representative in the first Barnesville district. I want to thank Karen Wong, who belongs to a group called um, Prejudice uh, Duxbury. Pre Let me see. I don't have anything. Um, Karen, you can. Prejudice free Duxbury. <laughs> Prejudice free. Okay. Lost the gold. Prejudice free Duxbury. I want to thank Wayne Chinock, and he is the um, founder, I guess, and coordinator of the Black Lives Matter um, vigil, peaceful vigil every uh, Sunday evening in the sandwich. And you can join him and in front of the library and they kneel for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Um, I want to thank uh, Jamila Cotter, who um, came on from us from Philadelphia, right? Uh, and She's an administrator and a, a repeat guest. I thank you, Jamila. I want to thank Jim. Bad Butler. things do not happen in Philly. Yeah, <laughs> Don't you. believe what he says. <laughs> yeah, and I would thank um, Jim Butler, um, who I, I think he may have clicked off. I'm not too sure, but I want to thank him again, being a, a repeat um, guest with us. And I invite you all to join us again um, we meet every two weeks here at four o'clock on Conversations That Matter. And you can visit um, my page. It's called Let Me Tell You a Story on Facebook. And drop us a story or two, um, just your experience with racism, um, your experiences in general, um, experience of someone you know. We really like to um, hear from you. It's a safe place. There's uh, no judgment. Whatever story you choose to put there, stays there, and um, it's, it's not, it's judgment free. So I thank you again for joining me. It's a really important conversation. I'd like to thank once again, our sponsors, um, Social Techie, Karen uh, Ryan, um, in helping us to keep this show running. I'd like to thank Kennedy Donovan and the Department of Developmental Services uh, for your sponsorship for this show. And um, we'll see you again here in two weeks. And thanks for joining us. <laughs>